Shield's Ladder by Australian author Greg Egan is a hard science space opera and as trippy a journey through the quantum realm that you're going to find in science fiction. Published in 2002, I recommend Shield's Ladder if you've enjoyed Egan's novels Incandescence or Diaspora. Shield's impresses with similar takes on eight corporeal beings, traveling as data through space, searching for assumed sentient alien life, and holographic-like settings. I recommend Shield's Ladder if you are fascinated with the type of science fiction that imagines the nearly unfathomable expanses of time and the future. I recommend this novel if you're willing to be turned around and upside down by concepts in physics that theorize what might be out there, not only in the far reaches of space, but also in the deep trenches of subatomic levels. Egan imagines worlds unlike any other and applies his own inventive theories of quantum physics to bring them to life. I don't recommend this novel as a first step for reading Greg Egan or if theoretical physics and science fiction is new to you. If you've got experience with the author, I think this is an absolute page turner. If you haven't read his work before, I would imagine being really turned off really quickly, trying to navigate the physics heavy language. In terms of preparing you for how spoilery or not I'll be, I'm not going to spoil any reveals or discoveries, but because I think that it'll be helpful to the reading experience, I'm going to approach this with a combination of plot and character summary and a real strong lean into how to read this novel agenda. Shield's Ladder is set tens of thousands of years in the future. Earth, the universe, humanity bear no resemblance to our present. The characters in this novel travel as data light years across the universe. Once they reach their destination, they can remain acorporeal or have a body constructed for them from whatever raw materials that may or may not be available. The first challenge, I believe, for most readers will be conceptualizing this type of existence. The cheat notes here are that each individual, and I use the term individual very lightly, has a cusp or a mediator. These are referenced frequently throughout the read. This will be very helpful to know going in. Once cusp is their, let's say, central processor, their essence, a digital spirit, what have you, the post-human characters through their cusp tether their decision-making at a quantum level. This avoids the more classic idea that making decisions in the broader universe initiates copies of the individuals throughout a potential multiverse that may have made different decisions, thus creating infinite new branches of the future. In understanding these characters, you'll often hear reference to one's mediator. This is basically an artificial intelligence linked or residing in the brain or what serves as the brain. One's mediator is like an uber translator. Mediators for different characters will interface and exchange language, emotion, body language, tone, any type of posturing that you might want to present beyond just the meaning of words. Interesting about cusps is that once a decision is made, that's it, that's the decision. There aren't versions of yourself in another dimension that made a better decision or a worse decision. The sort of end around on that is that you can make backups. If you make a bad decision and you blow yourself up, for example, you've got a backup ready to enlist. Ideally, the backups are created regularly, lest you lose a lot of data, experience, existence. Egan sets the table, introducing Cass, a physicist who's traveled to a research station on the distant world Mimosa. Cass will need to make her case to a board of other scientists in order to gain permission to run her experiment. It's important to note here that Cass, like any other physicist, has a foundation for her theories, the Sarum Payet rules. I'll not attempt to explain the full theory. It's not necessary for you to know this fictional scientific theory, other than that it's a generally accepted dominant theory of physics and the most fundamental of quantum graph theory equations. Another tip here, if understanding these rules or equations is not happening, move on. You really just need to know that the Sarum Payet rules are basically almost accepted, unchallenged scientific law. So she's on Mimosa. Mimosa is host to the Quietener, a stable and sterile, noise-free environment from which to experiment as neutral an environment as possible. Here, Cass can test the unstable theories that she's been working on. At Mimosa, a universe-altering event will occur that threatens the existence of thousands of worlds Enter the Nova Vacuum. The Nova Vacuum will expand at half the speed of light and will swallow any life, planets, stars in its path. Egan will fast forward the story hundreds of years into the future. New characters are introduced, though there might be a holdover or two from the initial chapters. This is the far future and beings are nearly immortal given that they can clone or back up their consciousnesses indefinitely. The Nova Vacuum is the star of the show. This catastrophe or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, has erased countless worlds and populations. One of the benefits of data-based consciousnesses 
and faster than light travel is that entire world population evacuations are rather successful. Here Egan presents one of the philosophical deep dives that you may or may not choose to let your mind wander around in. The implication is that data beings need not set roots in one place given long lifespans and the propensity to drift into complacency. It might not be such a bad thing to be forced out of the rut, and given that your surroundings can be recreated, at least virtually, how important is it to be so stubbornly connected to just one place? I'm not taking sides, but when you consider that before the Nova Vacuum catastrophe, it wasn't unheard of that some worlds would enter a voluntary slowdown when one member of the population traveled light years away, this offset the time dilation disparity so that when the traveler returned to their home, friends and family were all still around the same age, not surprisingly, some found these policies to be ridiculous. It's a new day, new scientific theories are being considered, even the time-tested Serenpeyat rules are challenged, researchers obsessed with the Nova Vacuum threat phenomenon are at ground zero on the Rindler. The Rindler is a space vessel keeping pace at a brief distance from the border of the Nova Vacuum. The community of scientists on the Rindler have in common a desire to study the NV, as the cool kids call it. Literally nobody in the book calls it that. Anyway, where the drama unfolds is that half of the researchers on the station are trying to find a way to destroy the NV, and the other half are trying to preserve and study it. Guess what faction is called the preservationists? Nope. The preservationists want to preserve the rest of the galaxy and beyond. They want to destroy the NV. The yielders, on the other hand, see great opportunity in studying the NV and wish to understand the phenomenon. Yielders and preservationists will collaborate while maintaining a cautious cynicism toward the motives of their rivals. There is enough common ground to collaborate, but when it all comes down to it, the only way that the yielders will be able to sway the preservationists to their side or almost to their side is to demonstrate a compelling reason to not destroy the NV. One such option would be to find sentient life inhabiting said phenomenon and thus make a anti-genocide argument. Could anything exist deep down in the quantum realm that would qualify as life? That's left for the reading experience, but I'll tell you, Egan will make the ride as trippy and thrilling as possible. There are quantum physics theories, fictional and not fictional, that are difficult to wrap your head around. This doesn't have to slow down the reading experience. Egan gives the layman, like me, plenty of opportunity to grasp the general and most important ideas. Before I get to my non-spoiler five likes and five dislikes, here are a few cheat notes on a few more terms that I think are gonna help you out. You will see these more than a few times. Quantum theory is front and center throughout the story. Vendek refers to something that is akin to a microbe element or a structure at the quantum level. They measure in at 10 to the negative 33rd power of a meter. For non-physicists, it means that they're just really small, smaller than a proton small. Planck worms, if the preservationists can create what they call plank worms, they can send these plank worms, I'm gonna call them quantum level replicators, into the Nova vacuum. Theoretically, this will destabilize it and, in a sense, destroy it. Because the book has a strong will they or won't they find alien life vibe, the term Xenob is tossed around. Xenob can be assumed to be referring to sought out alien life or really just alien life or alien elements. In my five likes and five dislikes, I'm going to keep it spoiler free until I tell you otherwise. This way you can get my take on Egan's characters and a bit more information to help you decide if you want to take this book on. The last few likes and dislikes will be for those who've read the book and want to get more into the weeds with me, and they will have spoilers, but I'll let you know when that happens. Dislike number one, I needed the first half of the book to sell me on why Chikaya was the main character, and more importantly, how as a newcomer did he so quickly ingratiate himself as one of the main players among the other seemingly more brilliant scientists. It's unclear what he was bringing to the table. In the second half, he more than contributes, of course, but I wasn't buying his status early on. Like number one, people are basically immortal. This makes time dilation kind of interesting. If you leave a place and 10 years for you is 100 years for those in the place that you left, it doesn't mean that they're dead. It just means that you've been away from them for generations and they've lived hundreds of years not knowing you or barely remembering you. They're like strangers now. It's fascinating the way that Egan muses about familial relationships that are tested by time. How close can even a parent-child relationship be or remain if the father and the son have lived separate lives with other families for hundreds of years? The main character, Chikaya, feels very young, but by our standards, he's very old. He's likely a great grandfather many times over. The book also provokes deep thoughts about friendships, special moments, accomplishments, 
Let's say that you make a discovery or some big heroic action. Is the elation diminished because those you would most want to share the news with have lived 500 years of life that didn't involve you? Like number two and dislike number two, Sophus's lecture is very interesting. I only grasp about 2% of the quantum physics rules and the theories that he speaks of, but it perfectly embodies one of my favorite aspects of the Greg Egan reading experience. I don't think that I'm ever gonna really grasp quantum theory. I believe a lecture would probably be over my head. Because it's woven in with Egan's storytelling, I'm distracted enough to let my guard down, my doubts, lack of confidence, whatever, and some of the ideas seep in and around my own sabotage and I get smarter by an inch. The dislike is that the info dump in Sophus's lecture feels too much like he's talking to me and the other doofuses in the audience and not to the scientists in the room. Egan fixes this a little bit by giving lip service to the notion that Sophus isn't really talking down to the audience in the room, but it still sort of feels like it's directed at me and not at the audience of physicists. My take on this might be easily contradicted, especially because Sophus doubles down on the I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know posture, but I'd counter with, keep in mind, we're talking centuries of research into the issue. Like number three, Greg Egan might just be the most important science fiction author writing today. When I think of what is the job of science fiction literature relative to it being important for me, it's the ability to imagine the future and speculate about the universe. Nobody comes close to giving the genre what Egan is bringing. The work is mind expanding and it challenges us in the best kind of science fiction way to consider, to speculate about what the universe will be like in the future, what our place in it will be. After I read an Egan novel and I start on something new by another author, there are ways in which I find the work by these renowned authors, authors I really enjoy, to be lacking in comparison. Like number four, elements of the universe building. It's mentioned that one could flee the vacuum by beaming themselves light years to a new planet, and when that planet was threatened, no big deal, just send a spore package ahead to another barren planet to get it ready for the next evacuation. Okay, everything else now might be considered spoilery, so stick around or just skip ahead to the Elton John-esque Shields Ladder music at the end. Like number five, Sexual evolution and imaginative sexual organs, though male and female pronouns are used, this genderless approach to sexual biology was pretty cool. Dislike number three, for thousands of years, the Nova vacuum was a mystery, unapproachable, indestructible. Once the action begins and Mariama and Chikaya end up down inside of it, it feels like there's any number of things that could destroy it. There's plank worms, quibbits, who knows what else. It all felt a little bit too convenient to the story. Dislike number four, I had a lot of difficulty visualizing anything happening in the Nova vacuum. Though the plank worms were described as dark and the Vendex as pastel, after two readings, I still don't have a comfortable image of either. I also admit that I can't form a picture in my mind of any of the characters in the book. Dislike number five, I think I'm gonna dump this into the dislikes since I've used up all the allotted likes. The story that Chikaya tells of the anachronistics exiting cold storage, it feels a little bit far-fetched the hoax continuing for centuries, as well as so many planets being invested in these ruses. It feels like a reach. I'm talking about how they lie about how the war is still going on. Where it is very interesting, however, is the concept of gender being eliminated. Egan delivers a very interesting genderless future humanity. Bonus-like, I was actually able to understand some of the big picture elements of the quantum mechanics, time and space implications in the honeycomb graph, and some of the attributes of the Vendex and the Xenobes. I wouldn't say that I grasp enough to articulate or teach it to anybody, but enough to satisfy me beyond just general awareness of the quantum realm's existence. Bonus, bonus like. For big fans of the book, I'm gonna note page 164 and this part about the sociological impact of being stuck on a planet for thousands of years. Egan brings up a point of how humanity tends to fetishize the mundane environment around them. This is one of those moments where a single line captures a huge insight into human behavior. Greg Egan's Shill's Ladder is fascinating and it only gets more fascinating as the story unfolds. This is hard science space opera with a deep dive into theoretical physics, quantum realms, and surreal alien behavior and analysis of unusual alien life. Thank you for watching, I'm Michael Everts and this is fit to be read. In this great surrender, we will yield the day. Search the void of this quantum realm, must not turn away. An enthralling vacuum, and you know it's true.
There's enough for a moratorium All depends on you Zenobes and Vendex in the bright And the signalers Just enough for the preservationists That we've come this far Sprites and air flowers in the bright Let's put this to rest It's enough to make preservationists Leave the veil